This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Dr. Kimi Wanda-Warren, Race and Ethnicity in America. I'm uh, glad to introduce a speaker today, uh, Mr. Ari Ahmed. Um, all right, um, this is going to be an informal talk. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Um, I have some themes, I'll, uh, kind of four themes I'll talk about, but if uh, Mr. Ahmed has some uh, topics that you're interested in, have a question, just raise your hand. Um, it's no big deal. So it's kind of an informal question and answer session, and it's kind of dealing with sort of conversation. All right. Um, well, I guess we just want to start off with, uh, if you're here for the hip hop presentation with hip hop and Islam, uh, we'll probably start with that. But I want to start with, before that, getting into uh, kind of the biography of uh, Mr. Ahmed. So I just wonder if you could tell people about yourself, your family history, where you're from. Okay, so uh, my family is originally from India. My parents immigrated to the United States in 1967, settled in Springfield, Ohio, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, I went to college at Miami University in Ohio and, anthrop and studied anthropology and African American studies. Uh, went to grad school at Indiana uh, in the same uh, subject areas. And then I've been working in multicultural affairs ever since. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I started performing spoken word poetry uh, and I started getting involved with hip hop activism and uh, advocating uh, for social justice uh, and using hip hop as a, as a mode of being able to, to create social change. Uh, and so since then I've put on many festivals and I've been very involved with uh, hip hop community and music as a whole and arts and just the whole concept of arts and activism. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So now I do a lot of work around intercultural communication, social justice education, uh, now a lot of stuff on Islam, and I'm, and, you know, ongoingly involved in the hip hop activism work. All right, thank you. Um, actually, as a geographer, I'm always interested where uh, people are from. So have you? Obviously, not a protest. <laughs> uh, um, actually, have you been back to India at all? This, yeah. Yeah, many right times. Now? Yeah, I've been. I think like seven times or where something. Where in India? Like that. My family is originally from Hyderabad, India. Okay, southern. Uh, southern, southern India. India. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, hip hop is now starting to penetrate there too. It's getting everywhere now. <laughs> it's interesting, my mom's from Nepal, so kind of seeing some influence of yeah. rap in Nepal. It's more into fashion now instead of like the message. Yeah. That's kind of slowly creeping in, so it's interesting the globalization of rap. Yeah, I studied in Nepal as well right. when I was in college. I, I studied uh, the coexistence of Hinduism and Buddhism in Nepal. That's a big mix there. So yeah. Even to myself, I can't tell family members that they practice with one Hindu. Yeah, it's Hindu. very confusing. <laughs> yeah. So you're, I guess you're a brother from another mother. <laughs> All right. Um, well, if you have any questions on on your uh, in terms of background, just raise your hand and let us know. Uh, we're just going to kind of link into more of the hip hop. Um, Give an example. It's the mosque. Sorry. The mosque down here on 911. That's inappropriate. Bill Riley has something to say about Amir. We'll get back here in a second. Um, um, okay, going to hip hop. Uh, when did you first start um, rapping, or did it go from spoken word poetry? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a spoken word artist. I mean, okay. I, I don't. Um, and uh, yeah, I started performing in 2001 uh, when I was in graduate school. Started performing at open mics, and then quickly got picked up by a group that was performing around the region. Uh, done a lot of performances around the Midwest, and also in, in Germany and uh, in Czech Republic, France. Uh, so, so yeah, I was really kind of thinking that that's what I was going to do, and then I found out. Of, then I probably needed to get a regular job. And so that was when I ended up getting into higher ed education, working in multicultural affairs. Okay. Kind of mentioned in your earlier presentation, you had- It's, it's short, they have a right to do it. I'm sorry, I was gonna ask who your influences are. I'm guessing it wasn't Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> it's not Bill O'Reilly, uh, no. Who are some of your hip hop uh, influences, some artists you respect? Yeah, I mean, so when I was in high school, college, I was listening to I mean, I was when I was in high school, I was listening to stuff like I was listening to a lot of different things. I, I I'm into all different kinds of things, not just hip hop. But I think that's part of what appeals to me about hip hop is that it's connected to so many things. But I, I mean, I was listening to you know Tupac and uh, Dr. Dre and things like that in high school. I was also listening to Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul, um, Thinkable Planets, um, and then you know, and then like, so I finished high school in 1996. I started college in 1996, which was the year that Pac 
was killed. Pac was killed like maybe like a month after I started college. And then that was also the year the Telecom Act getting passed, which basically was the consolidation of the corporate media, which basically squeezed out independent media voices. And that was really the, the, the birth of the bling bling era, you know. And so, you know, basically what that forced to happen was that people like me and a lot of my people in my generation had to move into what became called the underground uh, to be able to find what we found to be um, hip hop culture that was, that really spoke to us, uh, that was inclusive, that was, um, yeah, that was moving. Uh, and so that, so really ever since then, you know, since I was in college and then uh, into the, into, you know, into the 2000s, I, I was really kind of more an independent hip hop uh, movements. And a lot of the people I listened to are like my friends, you know, and I, those of you who are, who are here earlier, pretty much everybody I played are people that I know. And that's just kind of how, how it's been since then. All right. Um, you also mentioned in the presentation that you're part of the Hip Hop Congress. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell the students who you know, want to be here in the first part, like, what's that about and uh, kind of what they do? Yeah, so Hip, Hip Hop Congress is a grassroots uh, hip hop organization. We have chapters on college campuses and then communities all over the country, and we also have many abroad as well. So we're an international uh, grassroots hip hop network. Uh, I got involved when I was in graduate school. There was only like three or four chapters at the time. And I had been talking with some of my friends about arts and activism and, and music in particular being a way of bringing all different kinds of people together. And I really felt like when I met these people in Hip Hop Congress, I was like, well, hip hop makes total sense as a place to start because hip hop reaches so many different kinds of people. And it also has a, root, a rooted history and struggle and, and resistance. Um, and so for me, that was really, that made a lot of sense to me. And so I started putting on a lot of festivals and and events and things like that, uh, trying to create spaces where people from all different kinds of backgrounds can come together around music and culture uh, and kind of, you know, create a new norm, you know, in many ways. Because I, for myself, being South Asian and Muslim, you know, if I was going to be segregated out, you know, like, like, like a lot of, like, like a lot of what we see is we see a lot of segregation in our society, then I, my community, my group of people, my network was going to be very small. And I was very, okay, yeah, whatever you say, bro. Uh, but, um, but yeah, and so, and myself just being a person who's into all different kinds of things, a fairly eclectic person, so, you know, I just really didn't want to be isolated. And I, I, hip hop gave me the opportunity to be connected to a lot of different kinds of people, and I feel very thankful that I was embraced by the community. All right, um, as my students know, and I just told you recently, I'm interested in globalization of rap music. And hopefully the students now have had, they have my geography rap um, lecture, so they're experts in rap as well. Um, uh, I want to do a definition thing real quick, just to be um, clear that hip hop is broader than rap music. That, yeah. Uh, that's it. I just want to make sure that we're being clear about it. I know that you probably know that, but I just want to make sure we're being clear about that. That hip hop includes break, b-boying or breaking, graffiti, uh, graffiti uh, DJing, so, uh, and a lot of other things. But rap is one element of hip hop culture when we talk about and I could just go along that. It seems like uh, most people associate hip hop uh, with more African American communities, like in the South Bronx, like a very diverse neighborhood that it actually evolved from. So Latinos, African Americans, and others, especially breakdancing, is kind of, kind of a, a melting pot. Of, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. We had a discussion earlier about, well, rap, you know, ties to West African folk poets like the griots. Mm. But, um, you know, it's. More multicultural than yeah, it's been multicultural from the from the beginning, but the aesthetics it draws from are are, are through an involved black expression. But but yeah, it is a and, and we have to recognize the fact that there's even African you know <laughs> Africa is, is very much part of the formation of Latino uh, cultures and identities as well. So so um, but yeah, it was always a multicultural phenomenon from the beginning, and it continues to be. And so those who say well. You know, we it really should only be amongst a certain group of people. They they don't really understand what hip hop has been, ha and and continues to be. And the genie's out the bottle. It's all over the world now at this point. So to me, it's more about respecting that foundation, and uh, and the lessons that can be learned from that, and then also um, uh, the uh, tapping into the power of that. That hip hop connects to so many different kinds of people and creates this kind of virtual third culture space between all these other different kinds of identities that uh, people can uh, connect uh, around.
Um, for my students, uh, one of the first rappers I mentioned in that lecture was a Jamaican American, what was his name? Uh, DJ Cohort. So, kind of the idea of toasting and representation of belongings. Yeah, so it came from Jamaica, like the, the DJ culture of, of hip hop came from Jamaica, and, the, and, the, and then connecting that with rapping, the toasting culture of Jamaica as well, yeah. All right. Um, any other questions just in general about hip hop? <coughs> I'll do the beat. I'll be a beatbox. Uh, no. <laughs> now, like I said, I'm a spoken word artist, so I can do like a spoken word piece. And like, yeah, a lot of my political, spiritual conceptions, and just so I'll do a piece that's called the Grid. And this is uh, it could be viewed as controversial, but um, you know that's art can be that. Uh, so I was um, flying on a, on a on a plane, um, and you know in the Midwest you fly over, and it's like. You know the the earth is just kind of like a bunch of boxes, you know, and and I just kind of thought, you know, knowing what I know about indigenous cultures and um, knowing that the earth probably wasn't meant to be carved up in a bunch of boxes like that. So I wrote this piece. This earth I embrace has become a grid, a series of boxed off shapes and manipulated, mangled angles and tried to enforce the control that we will never have. They grid this and that made of lines that exist nowhere but in our over delineated minds. I see nothing but sharp, peculiar, perpendiculars creating a scission of division right through the hearts of those we force to depart. And in the wake of the grid is a stairwell to bid farewell of unbounded, rounded beings with a feeling of bruise and confusion. Why do they not let us over there? I see no lines. This is our earth. This is Mother Earth. We are interconnected in perspective of the universal force that makes us and them we. So why do you suddenly not make me feel free? When did our tree become your tree? How did you quietly kill me? As you speak as a preach of why you're right, your disrespect and attack is unjustified. You've lied to all to make your grid this sin within your moral right. And you talk of this man named Christ and how by some miracle he looks white. You teach me to ashamed my mane and my color. But who are you, brother? My color allows me to maintain my saying while you tell us to bleach. You preach a God that's not mine but insisted we find like wine. And if I listen to you, I lose my ancestors and my history. And if oral, you call it mythology. Just because you write it, don't make it true, because only a few came up with your book, and guess what? It's mistranslated. You have debated and argued, and your group has become divided. It's too complicated, it don't make sense, but you hide it. Because you don't want us to know that you cover up your flaws with your need for hierarchy and structure. As I puncture your ideas, you deny that you truly fear me. In your aristocracy and bureaucracy and hypocrisy of so-called democracy, because all else you think is anarchy, when I mention equality, you label it communism, socialism, or Marxism, and say it leads to volatility. But I speak the truth of love, binding all of our existence and the persistence that Buddha, Krishna, Christ, Muhammad, and Abraham are all the same color. And so are we. And only then will there be no grid. When we become encapsulated in the completeness and the simplicity of our common unified existence, there will be no grid. And we'll be one. So as I fly high in the air where I'm to be free, I look back down and imagine the grid disappearing before me. When I come back down, those lines will be erased, and you and I shall be we. I hope I didn't piss anybody off. <laughs> I feel like I pissed on Snap or something. <laughs> nice. All right, we're just going to end a, a hip hop part before going to the next section. Um, any general questions or working? Don't be nervous. <laughs> um, as for um, the uh, 3 a.m. booty call, post smacking, rock slinging aspect of rap and hip hop. I call that hip hop. You know, it's pop music, it's pop culture. And I think that a lot, I think people need to put a mirror up to themselves when they think about, when they project that um, popular hip hop culture is exclusively misogynistic and violent and and uh, and materialistic because I would argue that all of popular culture is misogynistic, violent, and 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 uh, materialistic. Uh, but yet it's different when we see black or Latino men on TV perpetuating that versus when we see Britney Spears, or when we watch a movie, or when we do any other engage in any other part of the uh, of popular culture. And so the reality is is that popular culture is a commodification of any authentic expression of culture. In any way, any any type of cultural form that is expressed, pop culture is a commodified form of that. 
So uh, therefore, there's a certain loss of meaning, purpose, value in that. And so that representation we see is very much negotiated for how do we make as much money as possible. And that's what happened when the consolidation of the media happened. And that's why those of us who really love and believe and breathe hip hop in our hearts really were just, you know, we're like, that's not what we understand hip hop to be. Uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have its place and there aren't aspects of it that do reflect authentic experiences of people's reality and it's a reflection of our society, absolutely. But at the same time, there's more to it than that. And that's, I think that's true of all popular culture. Y yeah. With a more global, like, the question I'm asking is, yes, we have a view of more globalized hip hop. Do you think the Islamic influence of hip hop will sooner or later have a more, uh, a more larger uh, influence on global hip hop? I think it already is. I mean, because of the, uh, were you here earlier? Yeah, I was here earlier. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that marginalized communities are grabbing onto hip hop as a voice yeah. to express themselves, which is really what hip hop was about from the beginning in South Bronx, people who were marginalized in society that people didn't pay attention to and people demanding to say, no, we're here and we matter. You know, and, and considering the kind of power dynamic that's going on in the world globally in terms of a lot of uh, uh, contexts in which Muslim people are um, <laughs> living in war and are um, you know, under very oppressive circumstances, whether it's through their own dictator governments or whether it's uh, the, the, the relationship between that dictator government and the West or whether it's uh, a Western civilization uh, country like our own invading a country, uh, whether it's uh, people who are living on the margin of society in France or Algerian and Moroccan, um, whether it's Surinamese people in, in, the ho in Holland, you're seeing that, well, you know, Turkish people in Germany. And, and the other thing in Europe in particular is that you're seeing Europe struggle with overall this whole immigration dynamic in Europe that is very different from the United States in terms of what it means to be German or what it means to be French and that it's you know total assimilation or you're not one of us uh, and that p passes out down through generations and so and so w what you see is people needing to express themselves and so I don't think it's exclusive to Muslims or Islam I just think that you can't you can't ignore the dynamic of Muslims being a part of this globalized hip hop phenomenon. And um, because there's so much part of the fabric of what's going on in the world because there's over one and a half billion of them. And so much tied into the politics and the social dynamic that's going on globally in relationship to Western civilization. Do you think it's gonna have a, more, a larger scale down the line as to uh, pop culture generated hip hop? Um, it could, I mean, I think that that I, I think it probably already should have, but really our media is so controlled. And so I think it's having an influence around the world, but I just think that we don't feel it the same way. I think it's having an influence in Canada in a way that it's not here because of their media is different and more open and more globally connected than our media is. Uh, and so I think that that, yeah, I think that dynamic is already happening. It's just that we kind of are, are, the, are a little bit disconnected as a society from what's happening already globally. Yeah. Now, do you, what are your thoughts on having artists who have gone through, uh, like some early days wanting to come to rap and hip hop mm -hmm. before of that and gone into more of a pop thing? Because you, you have artists here right. from outside that were so amazing yeah. that were changing. I, mean, I grew up listening to the same people. Right. Uh, and I look at it now and I think of how uh, there's more people who are uh, from, from that era talking about not what happened to the culture, not what happened right. within that process of hip hop or, or rap, but more of, uh, oh, well, this person, I think, is garbage because right. rap is just not anything. Well, I think there's always been a competitive spirit in hip hop, and so you can't really critique the fact that, I mean, you can, but I mean, it's just part of the culture that people are, you know, there's, a, there's always been that competitive spirit, people taking on each other and this and that. Um, and that's also part of how the self-regulation within the hip-hop community ends up getting resolved, and who's considered to be um, real and sometimes who's considered to be whack. But, uh, but at the same time, I would say that for myself and to participate in the culture, I try to spend not as much time focused on what I don't like about what, I, what, what I'm seeing and rather trying to cultivate a movement um, of artists. So like in my last presentation, I, I gave some names of artists that I feel like are a better representation of what I'm trying to see uh, represented. Uh, Maimuna Youssef, one of the artists who used to sing with The Roots, that I have, I'm executive producing her CD. 
uh, because you know I you know I want to be a part of these people rising up to a level of visibility. And if if the mainstream media wants to pay attention to them, fine. But if they don't, we know that we can't force them to do that. So either way, we have enough tools at our disposal with the internet to where we can cultivate our own movement and give people at least a choice. And that to me, that's that's where I'm at. It's like let's just at least give people the choice and see what they decide. Because what I see with my students, when I put these people on stage, they're like, how come I don't know who these people are? And I'm like, well, that's an interesting conversation about the media that we gotta have. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 And that's the reason why I feel like that's a distraction, uh, and, and that's why I try to really focus on what are we going to build. Like I don't really even spend a lot of time thinking about that because it's just it distracts me from what I'm trying to help build. You know what I mean? But yeah, I agree with you. It's a distraction. Whenever the, these people have this beef or whatever, this matter, it's older, younger. And then, it, yeah, and that's the reason why you don't hear me spend a lot of time being like, oh, yeah, these young kids, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just like, it's a waste of my breath. Yeah. Look at the app where they come out the most up and coming rappers. It's in between yeah. mainstream and in between underground. Right. Underground. He doesn't perform anywhere alcohol is served. That's something interesting about Lupe. Sorry, go ahead. I was wondering what's going on with this mainstream media. I don't know if you know anything. There's problems with it being released. Is it because media? I, control or what's going I don't. On? I don't know. I you know I don't know what's on there. I don't know the details, but I do know that there have been a few, few people sneaking through. Um, Kanye was a big reason why some people like Common and like and like Lupe were able to get into a level of visibility um, that they are. Um, and so I've been interested to see these different voices start to emerge in the in the in the hip hop community, uh, in mainstream media. But at the same time, you know, I know where they sit in relationship to a broader movement that's happening. So again, I don't try to spend too much time focused on that. Other than let's just keep building. Let's just keep building. I was gonna move on. Um, if you're interested in the topic, there's a documentary Beyond the Lines. Beyond, yeah, Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it a It talks point. about the commercialization for rappers that kind of forced to rap about what sells. Yeah, hold on. I want to tell a quick story about that artist, Maimuna Yusuf. Um, Maimuna used to sing with the Roots. She had a deal on the table to market her as the next Lauren Hill. She can sing, she can rap. She's an unbelievable, most, most talented person I've ever met in my life. Maimuna went into the meeting with the, with the record execs. And basically all they did, and remember I told you she's black, Native American, and Muslim. She's a very dynamic person, beautiful, you know, has her, a very original style, and all they talked to her in the meeting was how she needs to change the way she looks, change her name, uh, show more skin, blah, 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 and like physically in the meeting she was starting to get sick because of the way, all the things that they were telling her that was wrong with her, what she needed to change, what she needed to do, and she was like, I'm not gonna do this, and she, she walked away. And so that's the reason why myself and other people I know, we have to do it on our own. Because you have to compromise, I mean, you have to compromise way too much. And, you know, and for them, they're like, we'll just find someone else who doesn't have, that, that is willing to compromise. Or if for them, it doesn't even feel like a compromise. You know, so we'll just, we'll find the next person who will take eight cents a CD, you know? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Nas, hip hop is dead. That's yeah. a critique. Mm -hmm. um, if all right, we're gonna move on to Islam in America. Uh, some aspects. Um, I'm going to show a couple of videos. One of the um, some controversies um, recently is kind of a community center in uh, New Ground Zero, but there's been several critiques about that. And give an example: the mosque, the mosque down here on 9/11. That's inappropriate. It's it's sure they have a right to do it. And in and, and, and the Constitution, but it's inappropriate because a lot of the 9 11 families who I know say, Look, we don't want that. Yeah, That's, that shouldn't be there. But what about the. No, 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 no. no, no, no. But there's the president. Right? There's the president going, Well, they were right to do it. Yes, and then the guy this says, is America. And then the guy. This oh, is hold America. it, hold it. Listen to me because you'll learn. Yeah. All right? Thank you. So he says, to the press, yeah, they have a right to do it, and that's true. Yeah. And then the question is, 
but what about the wisdom of it, Mr. President? And he goes, I'm not going to comment. Whereupon, everybody in the country goes, what? Well, wait a minute. Let Come me ask on. you this. That Let me ask you this. Let me ask it. you this. So you're saying that that Americans are not smart enough to recognize that while it is part of our Constitution to say the freedom of religion and freedom to worship, and there were 70 families who are Muslim uh, who do buildings. also died in that building. Yeah. So you're saying that we, we, that his saying that they have the right to do it and not it's saying wrong. any more than that is really? why his approval That's rating so is going down. I'm showing that there is a gulf between they w Americans wanted to know what his opinion was on the issue and yeah, he wouldn't give it. We're but Americans. That's too. one, that's we one agree thing. With him. But you, know, so you, you agree with him. No, Most we're Americans. Americans. I'm an American. Look, let me break this to you. Seventy percent of Americans don't want that moss down there. We're so don't give me the we business. You want to bet on that? You want to bet? I'll show you that poll in a minute. Right? Is that Americans don't want, don't want it down. But why is that? But why aren't why we saying... Why is it inappropriate? Why is it inappropriate when 70% of Muslims killed this on 9-11? No. 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 Oh, my God! That is... Muslims didn't kill you. 70% of the... Can I get the gist of something held in the media? Um, and I'll talk about some events about the Quran burning um, later on, but I just want some of your reactions on in terms of uh, Islamophobia um, and then kind of maybe the media or Hollywood even portraying uh, these aspects. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. oh just well. Just a few points on this, uh, uh, I guess, speaker and this idea that um, he said 70%, I think a time poll said 61% of Americans weren't in favor of. I remember seeing the 70% too, actually. Sorry, okay. um, but I mean, yeah. it could be, uh, you know, polls are, they, they're snapshots. So, um, I, you know, I feel like this whole incident really exposed the degree of Islamophobia in our country and the fact that um, it's very easy to frame us as responsible uh, for things that have happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see, I, I was, you know, I appreciate the fact that there was, um, you know, allies in that, in that video that's, you know, are standing up for our community. I, I appreciated Mayor Bloomberg uh, standing up and saying that it's appropriate because it is to appropriate. And the people, so I think that the, the way in which people try to frame it as the ground zero mosque or whatever, whatever, that, you know, the, the whole project is by, was created by people who are advocating for peace and dialogue. And the the building itself was modeled after the Jewish Community Center. They're working with the Jewish Community Center of Manhattan uh, to, to build this project. And the Jewish Community Center was modeled off the YMCA. So basically what we're talking about is a YMCA, uh, two and a half uh, blocks from, uh, from uh, Ground Zero. And uh, I think that that's, I mean, I think it's completely appropriate for there to be people who want to uh, create a different um, dialogue, a different uh, kind of framing of, of Muslims and the Muslim community, and there are a ton of Muslim people who live in that area. Uh, so I, th I think it's completely appropriate. And I think that, in my view, that what you see there is um, not just Islamophobia, but you see a racial, there's a, in my view, there's a racial dimension to it. Um, and I also thought there was some sexism there, clearly, too. They're very much talking down to her, like a uh, very paternalistic attitude uh, in that particular view. And it, yeah, it was very much, to me, a very white male heterosexual kind of like, um, I matter more. And when they're making the point of what about the 70 families that were Muslim, it's like, well, that doesn't matter. The people that matter are the people that I care about, which are the white people. You know, and they're the and, and the white Christian people. They're the people that that actually matter. Their voices matter, not these people. We don't need to listen to them, because they're not convenient for my for for my worldview and what I want to say and think. And it perpetuates outwardly towards other people that that's a justifiable way to think about that that there are different levels of equity in in people's pain, people's suffering, people's experiences, uh, people's perspective, people's religion and uh, people's uh, reality. And I think that, for me, that's what I see, so, off the cuff. Okay. Do you think, um, part of that, this Bill O'Reilly thing is, is part of the media control that you were speaking of? Because I personally 
know thousands of white men, and I would say there's probably less than 1% of them that share his view. Well, I don't know about that, and I don't, I, I wouldn't jump to that, that critique. Um, you know, obviously he works for Fox News, and Fox News has found a market, and they've been able to, so, and, you know, I don't know who, I can't, I don't want to um, essentialize who that viewer, viewership is, where the, uh, where the money comes from. I did think it was kind of funny when uh, they were talking about who are the funders of this project, and whatever, whatever, and they were starting to talk about this guy who was like this rich Saudi oil guy, um, connected to the Bin Laden family, actually. And um, and uh, that, I think John Stewart said something about the fact that one of the, the second largest stakeholder in, in, in Fox, in, uh, what is it, what is it? News Corp, right, is that same guy who was giving the money to the, you know, and you know, there's video of people, um, of people on Fox News, Laura Ingram, and people saying, oh, I think this is a great idea, like a year ago, before it was a political issue, before it was turned into a way of scapegoating our community, which is what I believe this was all about. And what I think was so horrible about it was the way that the politicians stoked the, the, the hatred towards our community in this process, and, and really uh, perpetuated, in, in my view, that's what led to a lot of other the arsons and the, the other thing, the protests and the, a lot of the things that were happening. I don't think it was the only reason, but I think there was, in general, it, it fomented a climate of, of Islamophobia in our society. I'm sorry I didn't answer that thing about the corporate media, but I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah? Do you think that uh, a lot of people who follow his ideology or him himself uh, have their beliefs in what they don't know, like uh, their lack of uh, experience with people in the Muslim faith or what they've done I, yeah, I agree. I think that um, there's been a lot of, um, there's been a lack of context. And what I found, the presentation that I do this evening, I'm going to be, I've been doing it for the last couple years, and um, and what I find is that people lack context and information and desire context and information, reliable information, uh, at least the people who come. I can't speak for the people who don't come, but the people that I have experienced that are coming overwhelmingly. The majority of those people seem to want to get, get reliable information that challenges what they're getting because a lot of people don't believe everything that they see in the media. So, um, but but the reality is that when in the lack of an alternative voice, this is all people are getting, and it's it does. That's why I think that what the politicians and the media did this summer was so so problematic because it very much stoked and fomented people's existing fears and anxiety and very was very manipulative of, um, around the fact that so many people don't have context. Well, they didn't even ask people to try to speak out. Right, exactly. The, just the way that, that these individuals got marginalized and you know, and I, I think it's interesting because um, there's sometimes that there's this kind of uh, equation of the way that they're that they're not behaving properly but he he is he's a bro he's behaving inappropriately but they are too. But they're but they're standing up for a community of people that are not represented here. You know what I mean? So I mean, not to say that um, that it's justifiable to not to because you know if, you, if if those of you who've seen this, they stomp out. You know, they they walk off the stage and everything, and they go. So um, and so a lot of people were like, oh my God, you know that this is you know right, it's uncivilized and this and that or whatever. But but look what look at the difference between what they're standing up for and what the other person is perpetuating. So I think that there's a huge difference in that. Yeah, I think that that's you know another challenge. I think it's a challenge for all people of color and how we're represented in the media and the centralized and uh, always kind of side, always kind of like appeasing to the dominant. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously we're used as villains a lot and we're used as um, kind of enemies of the state or what, whatever it is, you know, and, 
and irrational, emotional, just, you know, there's a lot of, and there's a, I think you are gonna show a clip from Real Bad Arabs, right? Which is about Arab Americans, but, and I have, I have yet to see a really interesting media, like, uh, like video or documentary specifically about how Muslims are portrayed. And if anybody knows that, I'd like to know, because um, I, I really, um, I really feel like it's a big issue, and I think that, that we need to try to f have a broader dialogue of, of, of critiquing that. But I, I, but I do think that it falls into that, that, that this is another example of which Islamophobia ends up kind of blurring into racial uh, dynamics, because Muslim people are perceived to be people of color, overwhelmingly. That's just, and, and it's a way of foreign and otherizing us as not American, as not part of the fabric of this society, and therefore, um, we can other you and how we frame you in the media, and uh, and therefore you can fall into a lot of the demonization and traps uh, that we apply to lots of people of color in the media. One more question for Alan. Do you think that all the favors of Brown, Muslim Americans, and Islam, do you think it's just a cycle that they not know the like how Americans do not do negatively? And you can go as far back as uh, the time of slavery, when Americans and white males had the dominant role and dominant view. And slowly but surely, those views kind of can slow down. Do you think that views of Islam in America and um, I don't know, but I think to me the parallel is actually more with what happened to the Japanese during World War II, uh, and in terms of them being interned. And fortunately, that hasn't happened to our community. But I think that the suspicion and the the questioning of our patriotism, the questioning of our allegiances, um, the um, all of that, all of that to me very much parallels what I felt like I saw during the jet, uh, during the World War II. So I do think that part of it is representative of the times that we're in. Uh, but part of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is that with our community in particular, there's a broader context of the relationship between Western civilization and, and Islamic civilizations. And that, to me, contributes to the dynamic that we see today. Uh, you know, when you look at the Crusades, when you look at the reconquering of the Spanish Inquisition of, uh, in Spain, when you look at, at these kind of, kind of dynamics, when you look at colonialism, when you look at post-colonialism, when you look at neo-colonialism, there's a global dynamic that plays, plays a part of it that's relevant to our conversation of what's going on here in this country uh, with American Muslims in relationship to our broader society. So um, I can get into that in much more detail tonight, but, um, but I think that, that even though there is an element of like, this is representative of a bad economy, we're in war and that we've been framed and 9-11 happened and blah, blah, blah. I still feel like it's broader than that because I do feel like a lot of these dynamics were, there, there were a lot of dynamics that were true pre-9-11 that still, that <coughs> maybe are amplified post-9-11. And I think that that's something that needs to be considered as well. You have a question down there? Yeah. Uh, I can share it, and I, I don't, I, are you going to be putting anything on the website or anything like that? Okay. The presentation will be videotaped, and it's what Amita was talking about, the YouTube has Okay, right, that's right, she told me that earlier, so it'll be on YouTube, yeah. Maybe one more rap joint before we leave. <laughs> one more rap joint? Um, well, I don't know. I missed it, I'm sorry. Okay. Seven minutes uh, taking you. Uh, you had other topics you wanted to get to. Oh, uh, just one more topic. And then okay, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'll chime in with my lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, just wanted to, um, like with my class, I try to show there's aspects of New York City, but there's also aspects of Islamophobia nearby. Um, if you're aware of the Sheboygan uh, Mosque being denied. Um, don't have too much time to go over the real arrow. This is a video. But another, con like you're saying, there's this building. Um, uh, I guess Islamophobia, that's the, the term. But the burning of Qurans, there's uh, some groups that went out the international burning of the Quran Day on September 11th of every year. 
A planned, a planned public burning of the Quran did not take place today in an Amarillo City Park. News Channel 10's Elise Preston witnessed the crowd of protesters this afternoon. She joins us live in the News Center. Members of the Amarillo Unitarian Universalist Fellowship Church enacted a phone tree this morning, and they used Facebook to spread their message, Stop the Quran from Burning in an Amarillo City Park. <laughs> It was a song of unified victory for dozens of protesters at Sam Houston Park this afternoon. Christians, Muslims, Buddhists and atheists, all with different beliefs, but today one common belief brought them together. Great dishonor to desecrate the uh, sacred scriptures of any religious tradition. David Grisham, the leader of an area radical Christian group, attempted to publicly set fire to the Islamic holy book. Snuck up behind him and took his Koran. He said something about burning the Koran. I was like, dude, you have no Koran, and ran off. Many called Jacob Bison a hero after he took the Koran, already doused with kerosene, off a park grill. Some people put their hands on the grill that he has saturated the book on to burn it, to keep him from burning that and them, you know, and they were willing to sacrifice themselves, you know. Max Miller tells us he is thankful for. God has a way of intervening when he want to bring a lot of good, you know, from a bad thing. And so we look at this as a positive thing in light of September 11th and the feelings that are going on around the world. We just spoke briefly by phone with David Grisham. I just want to kind of lead this into a question. There's a lot of negative aspects that are out there, but have you been surprised that maybe some of the positive aspects have come from this adversity, that groups are coming together to support? Not just like one community, but community that come together? Yeah, yeah. On, on our campus, um, there's been a coalition of students um, around uh, taking on Islamophobia. And it's interesting, I don't know if, how many of you heard about this, but our student body president, we have our first openly gay um, student body president on our campus right now. And he was being harassed uh, and targeted. There was this blog, whatever, whatever. And um, his name is Chris Armstrong. And uh, he is. A, a, an alum who's now assistant attorney general of Michigan was harassing him tremendously. And so, and actually like Anderson Cooper ended up covering it and then it was on The Daily Show and all that stuff, it became a really big thing. And so now we have this kind of coalition of people taking on Islamophobia as well as homophobia on our campus. And, and we're kind of creating kind of this culture amongst our students in, in which all of these groups are, are building coalition around the idea of taking on hate, bias, and discrimination on our campuses. Around uh, these issues, so um, so yeah, I think that I've been seeing that on the ground right in front of me, and I think that that's uh, something that's very interesting. I think it it does create a lot of curiosity, and I think that that's the reason why there's been a lot of people coming out for a lot of the things that I've been doing, um, and from what I've seen from other people as well, uh, because I think that there's a void in knowledge and information, and people want it, and uh, and also I think genuinely a lot of people just don't want to feel this way towards. 1.6 billion people. So I mean, so I feel like that's a lot of what I've been seeing. Um, one last question, maybe from the audience. Yeah. Oh. Oh, let's go back there. Hey, hey, don't mind. I, I, those of you who aren't familiar, how hopeful are you that Islamophobia will dissipate or be dissipated, and what do you think it will take for that to happen? Uh, I think people need context. I think people need education. Uh, we need allies. Uh, that's I think that's what this is about. It's about allies, um, and then also I think that we have to be able to connect what's going on in our society with our involvement, our country's involvement and role globally, uh, because I think the lack of information about what our government and what our country does globally uh, creates a lot of problems. It creates um, incoherent. Uh, uh, norms like they hate us for our freedom you know for that to be a dominant narrative post 9-11 for anybody who has any basic context of what's going on globally uh, would be very would be easily be able to recognize that that doesn't make any sense uh, and so um, that's uh, I, that's the reason why I think context information both domestically as well as internationally is extremely important like um, one more, one more, I feel like I'm forcing you. No, that's all right. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Um, okay. I'll do something about. Okay. Yes, we're in. Okay. 
Okay. Um, there is a moment for which I wait, for the time is late, yet our fate shall guide us to it. For a moment can alter all to which surrounds, for we are bound to be found within the sounds of change. The range to what extent is in complement to the transient state of the moment. I am propelled through time with the belief that the light will shine and penetrate the darkness of our constructed minds, because the battle is being waged as the sage becomes the negotiator of those enraged. And jihad is the inner battle within our souls that Allah foretold to remain within the fold. And Islam is the inner peace that shall cease to darkness, as Shaitan remarks that our mark is left by a tempted heart. But as battle, battle balance moves toward the light, our inner fight shall free us of our decayed human plight. One may call this ideal, but I feel this moment will become real. Because Buddha prophesied that it would come, as we run to believe paradoxical puns, though one shall overcome and consume all who live beneath the sun. The one shall, oh man, I forgot this piece, I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot it, I just did, yeah. <laughs> so anyway.